The idea of archetypes, primordial images representing universal symbols rising from the collective unconscious, the place where humanity's common psychological experience that transcends time and space is taught, was first introduced by Carl Gustav Jung. These complex images surround defining experiences of human life. Their reflection is ingrained not only in our psyche, but also in our culture, literature and mythology. In this video, I'd like to outline the mother and horse archetypes characteristics present in Game of Thrones, Sansa Stark and Sandor Clegane, and cast some light on the deeper meaning of their interactions. Sansa Stark and the Mother Archetype In the beginning of the first book, Sansa emerges as a naive and obedient girl, studying diligently to become a courteous young lady and marry a beautiful prince. Her blonde naivety is often mistaken for stupidity, which is more often than not vexing for the reader a proof of how well-written she is. Her unblemished demeanour leaves her standing naked to the world and vulnerable to her enemies, whom she mistakes for her friends because of her superficiality and the blinding veil of her fantasies. In Sansa's childish imagination, the world is a beautiful place full of valiant knights, righteous kings and queens and bloodless victories. When her father loses his head in front of her eyes, her entire world shatters into pieces and her own self along with it. This drives her to a brief contemplation of suicide, but despite the severity of the impact of the incident on her psychological state, she remains unable to act against the oppressors, succumbs to fear and becomes even more subservient than before. Had she done otherwise, it would have cost her her life, but it also means that, despite all, she hasn't abandoned her fantasies yet. Joffrey and Cersei do become monsters in her eyes, but she still believes in the concept of true knights and holds appearances in high regard. She's never a schemer, but she's a survivor. Through her lies, she protects herself from certain death. Through nodding and courteous smiles, she dances through hell. Sansa is an unusual character that remains a pawn with unspoiled heart, but she learns. Slowly, but she does. We can confidently anticipate great things from her character, but first she must undergo the transformation from a girl to a woman. This is her journey, and that's why Sansa represents the mother archetype. Every archetype appears under a huge number of aspects, and the mother archetype is no exception. It's reflected in the women with whom one has a relationship, as well as in mythological goddesses and things arousing devotion and awe. We distinguish three main aspects of the mother archetype, which are interestingly exactly the same as the three feminine figures of the Game of Thrones seven-faced god. William Irwin Thompson, American philosopher, said about them. The three images of the goddess, maiden, matron and old crone, present us with the three archetypal relationships of the female to the male. She is huge and calls us from the womb. She is beautiful and calls us to her bed. She is old and ugly and calls us to the tomb. The archetype can also have positive, as good mother and positive transformative character, negative, as terrible mother and negative transformative character, or ambivalent connotations, as goddesses of fate. In regard to Sansa, I'm going to discuss some of the general characteristics of the mother archetype reflected in her, as well as the image she mainly represents, that is, one of the maiden or virgin, a positive transformative character. In a figurative sense, symbols of the mother appear in things representing the goals of our longing for redemption, our need to return to the source, abode of the soul, and recovery of faith. For Sandor, Sansa is the very embodiment of these connotations. His longing isn't conscious, however. It only emerges from the subconscious on occasion. As I discussed before, the Hound is a man of lost faith who derides dreams and hope. Often, however, what we resist the most is what we secretly yearn for, and that's crystal clear in his case. The Mother grants gifts through sacrifice. Sandor is tried by fire and must transform his rage in order to be acknowledged by Sansa, or in other words, in order to regenerate the positive instincts represented by the mother. Robert Arryn must obey Sansa and control his temper to be given her attention. Through sacrifice, meaning transformation and rebirth through suffering, does she sustain and provide fruit and fertility that prompts toward further growth, for which in ancient mythology she is depicted as black earth, in need of fecundation. Interestingly, this is also associated with Anubis, whom I discussed in the Hound video. Therefore, not only does the mother give, but she also takes in a cycle of birth and death. Symbolically, she's also a great temptress, poison, abyss, the underworld, and anything inescapable like fate and death. Those who abstain from worshipping her get her cold hate. Even the innocent Sansa became the crucial element of the conspiracy against Joffrey, although unwittingly. The poison vial that killed him was carried in her hairnet, 
Edith is beheaded in her presence, Sir Dantes dies helping her, and Lisa is pushed to her death in front of her eyes. She's not a direct cause of their deaths, but she plays a decisive role in their deliverance from life. The negative aspect of the mother archetype is, however, most prominently reflected in Cersei Lannister, who is the very definition of a poisonous seductress. Above all this stands the law of transformation abided by by the mother, through which she grants wisdom that surpasses reason, depicted in Game of Thrones as maturation of the man Sansa is connected to. In the process, she herself is driven towards maturation, especially through the confrontation by the horse archetype reflected in Sandor. In man's psychology, the archetype of the enema, his unconscious feminine side, often appears mingled with the mother image, for which he also projects his motherly figure's individual traits onto other women he becomes close to. This is certainly evident in Robert Aaron's relationship with Sansa. An interesting act of motherly solicitude is shown in the song Sansa sings during the Battle of the Blackwater in Baylor's Sept and later to the Hound. She prays and sings to the mother of the Seven for her family and friends, but also for all the knights and soldiers that would die in the battle and all the wives and children that would mourn them, but also for the imp and finally for the hound, thinking, he is no true knight, but he saved me all the same. Save him if you can, and gentle the rage inside him. Maiden The positive transformative aspect of the mother archetype is the maiden, or virgin. She's portrayed in many different goddesses associated with transformation, like the muses, and justice or wisdom, like Sophia, personification of wisdom, a central idea in philosophy and religion. Epona, protector of horses, ponies, donkeys and mules, and the goddess of fertility, is particularly interesting given the connection between the mother and the horse archetypes symbolically depicted in the goddess. In Game of Thrones, Sansa's virginal role, so to speak, can be mainly explained through her importance in preserving innocence in a warring world, although much to her detriment. Her journey is that of a maiden slowly becoming a full-grown woman whose naivety is transformed into wisdom. In order to mature, she's been confronted by elements diametrically opposed to her nature. In this unconscious state, she's been a puppet master's gullible marionette without volition, which is, by the way, another archetypal story best portrayed in Pinocchio. She's harmless, but not exactly virtuous. She's a weak character unable to act or think on her own account. She's a sleeping maid, dreaming of beauty and splendour, and waiting to be woken by a magical knight, which explains her fascination with Durell's. Her behaviour is aimed at her survival, for which she's still, ideologically, stuck in the childhood stage. She lives in a world of appearances. The Virgin is associated with visions, mysteries, ecstasy, transformation and sublimation. Sansa's influence on the Hound provokes emergence of his lighter side. She's in turn transformed by his darker side, which adds oil to the fire, so to speak. As he opens her eyes about her notions of justice and knighthood, she confronts him about his harsh and aggressive attitude. Sandor becomes a substitution of the role of knight or warrior of the Seven in her animus, which is in its second stage, Man of Romance, and Sansa transforms Sandor's anima into the third phase, Mary, as she seems to possess virtue through his perception. Later, Sansa's animus takes the form of the man as a professor, clergyman or orator, a role fulfilled by Littlefinger, who's just another puppet master, but at the same time a lesson to show her that she must become an active participant in the Game of Thrones. She's being further developed from the maiden into the mother, which is reflected in Robert Aaron's attachment to her. She substitutes his mother for him. Lady of the Beasts I'll also briefly discuss Lady of the Beasts aspect of the Great Mother archetype present in ancient art. The myth is particularly accented in Cersei Lannister, but it's also present in its gentler and more agreeable form in Sansa. It's an aspect of the great goddess related to the world of animals, which she both dominates and protects. In other words, it's the womanly rule over primary instincts, represented by the horse archetype, and their healthy integration into one's behaviour, but also their prioritisation and taking over one's body and mind for survival and procreation. In mythology, She's represented by goddesses of Hunt who dehumanised the male into a beast or a warrior because he must protect and provide for the female. The Boeotian goddess from the 7th century is depicted flanked by wolves and with a trout in her belly. Sansa is first and foremost a tully, both in looks and behaviour. Their words are family, duty, honour. They put servitude to this triad above all else. The goddess represents opposition of life and death. Here, it's expressed by the life-giving swastikas and by the bull as the symbol of sacrifice, death and castration. As for Sansa, she doesn't dominate, at least not yet, but treats gently all the beasts, the Hound, Joffrey, Littlefinger, either because she chooses to or lacks the strength of character to oppose them. She's not a fully-fledged, independent being yet, 
which we can clearly notice in juxtaposition to Circe, whose character is the very definition of a lady of the beast. Seductress, dominatrix, independent queen, power hungry. She's the forbidden and the passionate. Sansa is more like the lady of the plants aspect. She likes Tyrells because they are like flowers and she herself is like one. She has no independent motion, she often only reacts when necessary, and she grows slowly. Animal represents a higher stage of consciousness, as it stands for activity, drive, movement, sensory consciousness and sense of community, which are all represented by the horse archetype. Sansa must learn to integrate these qualities into her own character in order to grow up. Sandor Clegane and the Horse Archetype If you're interested in a thorough psychological and mythological analysis of the Hound, click here. The Horse Archetype is closely related to the Mother Archetype. It's the embodiment of wild freedom, non-conformity and sanguine temperament, of animal instincts and the unconscious. In dreams, it stands for the lower part of the body, which is associated with the source of animal drives. It's connected to sorcery and spells, especially the black horse, which heralds death. Sandor's horse is named after the stranger, the aspect of death of the seven-faced god. The horse is often a companion on the journey of self-discovery. One must first speak deep down to be able to raise his gaze upwards. The horse archetype comes to the surface during the development of Sandor's relationship with Sansa, as he wakes her up to the reality slowly and helps ameliorate obstacles on her journey. In Buddhism, horse represents effort in seeking universal truth. Prince Siddhartha first leaves the palace as a young ruler in his chariot pulled by his horse Kantaka. During that event, he comes to see the true nature of reality and witnesses suffering for the first time, which is the beginning of his path towards enlightenment. He subsequently leaves the palace on the same horse. The horse later dies of a broken heart when Siddhartha leaves him, which can be seen as fulfillment of his purpose, which was to draw Siddhartha's gaze to the reality and thus set him on his path towards the attainment of Buddhahood. The horse later reincarnated as one of his followers in a curious reversal of roles. Siddhartha transformed into Buddha and Kantaka into a higher stage of the incarnation cycle, the human stage. The gist of the story can also be found in Sandor and Sansa's story, in which the positive and negative must learn to integrate each other into themselves. They teach one another, although often indirectly, to better themselves. In ancient creation stories, horse represents physical manifestation of the creator, for which we could interpret the interference of the archetype as an act of order establishment. As I mentioned before, in Sandor and Sansa's case, it's an act of mutual transformation, in which both must learn to integrate the trait of the other, specifically faith, mercy and reconciliation with the past for Sandor, and independence, assertiveness and awareness of reality in Sansa's case. Unbridled passion that forces us to face our deepest fears, repressed desires and primal instincts. That's the horse archetype. The horse gives us the opportunity to let those feelings surface and learn to control them. Sandor unveils not only the true nature of others, but also her own to Sansa. Her desire for knights later becomes actually a desire for a strong, ruthless, vengeful knight, which is in reality a desire for independence. Her darker, hidden side is similar to what Arya shows openly. On the other hand, Arya can't control these desires and they overpower her, make her heart turn into stone. On the contrary, Sansa hides it within and lets her, her complacency overpower her. She needs these attributes to materialize in order to become an independent being. In Sandor's case, the secret he holds within is devouring him from the inside. For this reason, the moment he shares it with Sansa is of significant import in regard to the progress on his own journey of transformation. What happens in our fantasy and dreams is often compensatory to the attitude of the conscious mind. This gives us insight into both Sandor's and Sansa's desires. Sandor's conscious desire is to kill Gregor. But all he longs for unconsciously is acceptance from others, but first and foremost from himself of himself. As for Sansa, her unconscious wishes revolve around veneration, as she consciously dreams of queenship and knights. She profoundly admires Marjorie, who represents queenship, and Loras, who represents the knight. Later, as she's growing up, her unconscious desire slowly transforms into sexual desire. This change is also reflected in the conscious wishes, as her fantasy about queenship and knighthood is shattered, and utter confusion is left in its stead. Let's look at the dream she has before she realizes she flowered. Women swarmed over her like weasels, pinching her legs and kicking her in the belly, and someone hit her in the face and she felt her teeth shatter. Then she saw the bright glimmer of steel. The knife plunged into her belly, 
and tore and tore and tore until there was nothing left of her down there but shiny wet ribbons. From psychoanalytic perspective, this is a very clear indication of emerging sexual desire. Particularly interesting is the dream of Sandor in her marital bed. He's again asking her to sing him a song, which means the same thing as before, an invitation to womanhood. The story of initiation into womanhood has been with us for thousands of years and still remains a popular theme in fiction. In mythology, it's known as the wild marriage. Most famous examples of this are the story of Beauty and the Beast or the myth of Persephone and Hades. Sandor represents the male principle of consciousness and Sansa the unconsciousness which needs to be awakened. Alright, if you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up and press the subscribe button. Feel free to leave any suggestions for future videos in the comments. Take care of yourself and farewell.